I mean, uh, for me, uh, the most amazing thing uh, is uh, the spider makes this web is very, very tiny, just like a two, uh, one or two uh, millimeter. Uh, it's very weak animal. It can be eat, eaten by any kind of creature easily. But uh, once it constructs those kind of network, uh, it becomes stronger. Uh, it can be used to catch different flies. Uh, spider cannot fly, but uh, this web can catch flies. So that amazed uh, amaze me uh, very much because like our human beings, we are weak, but we can make a lot of tools, vehicles, buildings to protect ourselves. So I think uh, we can somehow learn how spider builds the web and uh, uh, we can maybe use those information to design other kind of uh, materials, uh, do the bio-inspired uh, material design. Um, but we, we get really interested in silk because of the strength. So the individuals, actually, if you take a thread here, in, even though if you touch it, it, it seems very weak, but it's also very thin. Mm -hmm. And if you normalize by the cross-sectional area, you find that it's actually really strong material up to s strength of gigapascal. And in silk, the material itself, um, the, the proteins are connected by hydrogen bonds, which are very weak but then they're arranged in these uh, small crystals, nanocrystals, which make them to work cooperatively and actually very strong. And so geometric confinement is, is one of the key mechanisms to create very strong crosslinks between the silk proteins, but also one that's very resilient because the hydrogen bonds can break and they can reform and break and reform. And so the structure doesn't behave like glass. Glass, once it breaks, it basically just shatters, it doesn't reform bonds. But the protein and hydrogen bonds are very resilient in that respect. One uh, similarity between nacre and spider silk uh, is the beta sheet, uh, for beta sheet structure as Marcus explained, uh, the hydrogen bonds are very weak, but once they work in group, they something like you put two yellow books together, page by page, page by page, right. and they become very strong. Right. So this is similar mechanism as uh, in nacre. So we started, yeah, we started the work you know, actually when, when Jaws joined as a graduate student, right? Yeah. And we, at that time, we, it was, yeah, we looked at uh, really the protein mechanics, individual mechanics. We then worked on scaling it up to fibrils and fibers. And then in 2012, we, we had a, um, a paper where we looked at the entire web and deformation, and including wind loading and point loading. And that was the first time we actually scaled up to that level. Um, and we understood at that time the interplay between the different scales. So it's the material is important, right? The, the nonlinear behavior of the material itself, because it's not just the strength, it's actually um, how it behaves under deformation, that it softens and stiffens, ultimately breaks. Um, and the geometry is important, right? So if you change the density of these um, radial threads or circular threads, it's going to affect the performance of the structure. So we discern in the work systematically what are the elements of, of impact at each different scale. Okay, so two things, the material itself and the, the geometry. But actually, if you look at this from a broader perspective, the, the geometry really transcends everything in terms of scale. So here you have a scale you can see with your eyes. But if you look inside, you're going to see new structures in large. We, can't, we just cannot see them because our eyes cannot have the resolution. But you know, if you look at this in a more abstract sense, there's a structural hierarchy really from the macro all the way to the nano scale. It's amazing. So what we can learn from these uh, structures really, um, we can do mathematical analyses of the geometries and find the tents and all these things. And we actually have identified some interesting patterns of how these silk fibers are arranged and we've replicated them in synthetic analogs. Right? Mm -hmm. So we have uh, one of the students created these um, mesh-like structures which you can imagine are templates for fabrics or composites maybe um, and um, they mimic some of the design features we found inside this web and we extracted them and put them in a, in a large engineered human-made kind of mm -hmm. geometry. and. Actually, um, Isabel did some interesting work on looking at cocoons. Yes, uh, and the cocoon you have, you, they make a cocoon in the 3D structure. So we need like vertical support, and then it makes a cocoon like the 3D web. But what we did was to put the uh, silkworm in a flat environment, 
and then it spun uh, a web, a 2D web, which is more, uh, which is flat. And mm. so we tested it under wind load uh, to see how it behaves and did the simulations to compare. And the hope uh, is to find, to optimize the structure and uh, and also design yeah. new uh, geometries and uh, change the loading yeah. and optimize. If we let the silkworm spin the silk, uh, we cannot really control the the uh, the spinning speed. Uh, so we cannot really control the mechanical properties of the silk, but we can control the the geometry. So it's an interesting way of um, using an animal that usually produces the cocoon structure. Yes, and then make it and flat. you know sort of trick the animal into making a flat sheet, which uh, yeah we can use for. Um, fabric model, maybe extract design principles and, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, indeed, the silkworm silk uh, is a very good model, but as, as Bell said, it also have limitations because once silkworm make the uh, cocoon, it's uh, very irregular, so it's not very homogeneous and ideal as the composite uh, as we want. So that's why we also uh, working toward use a uh, technique like uh, 3D printing to print, uh, to first uh, take the cocoon silk uh, into the solution form and then use our printer to print it out as in the form as what we want, like this kind of uh, synthetic web. Uh, but we use, uh, so here you can see it's uh, just a substrate without uh, any printing pattern. But uh, this substrate is made of silk. So it's a very thin uh, film there, and once we print, we print on top of this thin film. And then we can use those fibers uh, uh, during printing as the reinforced uh, fiber to make uh, this uh, film stronger. You know, one of the beauties of having these actual 3D printed webs is you can, you can play with them and you can sort of, you know, you can do, I'm just doing this with my hands, but you can do it with testing machines. You can poke them and you can look at deformations. You can break them. You can put them in the wind tunnel. Isabel actually put them in a wind tunnel here at MIT and studied how they deform, right? Um, and it's a really nice way of um, controlling the geometry very precisely because spiders um, may build webs without our instructions, even and they look beautiful, but they're very irregular, and we don't really have full control. With the three dependent webs, we can change the thickness, we can change the number of threads, we can change the geometry in any way. And we can test some of the theories we've developed quite nicely. So we print a pattern on top of the frame, and then we put it in a tensile machine. And then uh, we print in x and y directions uh, rectangularly. And then also during printing, we put some fluorescent color inside the silk solution. So And then we can use UV light to highlight those fibers, as you see. So its deformation can also be clearly seen uh, by using those fluorescent color. Mm. Yeah, it's really amazing. <laughs> really amazing. Yeah, that cannot be seen from the natural web, but we can use fluorescence to, for those kind of synthetic uh, silk material. Mm. What we can ma mimic in synth with synthetic proteins, we can make, uh, oh, and that's what we've done with the, the printed silk actually are basically using our own engineered protein structures that are inspired from nature but do not actually exist in nature. Um, and we can actually do things like we can, um, we can add new functionalities, we can use silk, and we can add elastin protein to the silk. And now we have, this is Anna's work, right? yes. we can mix silk and elastin, which does not exist in nature. Right? We don't have silk and elastin in one composite material, we can make that. Um, or we can do completely synthetic things, and we've done work with graphene and nanotubes, so we added polymers like PVA to create the cross-linking with alcohol groups between individual carbon nanotubes, and it's basically mimicking some of the structures we have in silk or nacre. We have a, mm -hmm. a very rigid backbone, and we have some really soft interactions, and so we can do, we can play with different actual material implementations. We, it requires a level of abstraction, actually, to, to compare very different materials and identify common themes between them. Mm -hmm. So one way we've done is actually we've used category theory where we've described um, 
interactions between particles, which are, are of course, physical representations of the system, like hydrogen bonds and maybe um, brick and mortar kind of geometries, like in Maker. B but if you formulate it in an abstract way, then these um, patterns of interactions could be compared very effectively. So you've got a category from Nacre, you have a category from spider silk, and it's like, you know, drawing a tree, and, and you can see similarities in the structure in certain regions mm -hmm. in the mathematical analysis. And those would be the ones you can compare, and you can actually demonstrate proof that, um, you know, mechanisms of creating strength and toughness in silk are actually similar to the ones in Nacre and you can mathematically prove it. So it's not only uh, conjecture or maybe, you know, um, you know impression or, or hand-waving, it's actually mathematically sound. It's worth work on methods like this. Yeah. So yeah, basically when, when, once you have a, a, ma a category, you can, um, because the, the building blocks are not defined in absolute terms, actually defined with respect to one another. So you say, I need, you know, material A, which is very soft, and material B is very rigid, but then, a and B have different strengths, and A and B need to glue together very easily. Um, those are the kind of relationships that are defined in the category. So you can then replace them. You can replace graphene or silk with a polymer that you can 3D print. And you can make the same thing, the same functional form, actually at the macro scale, and it doesn't have to be nanoscale. So you can create, and this is what we did in that paper, we actually created um, large-scale models of graphene that you can basically, you can do graphene mechanics analysis, just like we're looking at the web here. So you can do some experiments like this, where we, you know, here we push in the silk, uh, where you can basically do some deformation experiments at the macro scale of graphene, um, and you don't need an AFM for the analysis. You can do torsion, you can do all sorts of things, do origami or whatever, you know. It's much easier to do this experiment in that way than doing it in actual graphene. Once you have a model, so you take the natural web and you make a model out of this, you can then use the computer to do all sorts of interesting things. You can do, you can analyze deformation responses, you can do simulation wind loading, but you can also um, extract geometric patterns. And if so, our collaborator, Tomas, he's an artist, an architect, and so he's interested in um, potentially using some of the design structures, some of the beautiful architectures we find in there, and applying them to structures and buildings. And it, you cannot simply take the web and cut it out. So the computer simulation is really essential in, in extracting patterns. It's sort of what we've done here, right? I mean, uh, yeah, we did that. a project on a roof design. Yeah, yeah yes. right. And then cable, so this is... Right, exactly, yeah. 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 <laughs> right. And, and actually, and, you, and you can't really... Um, you, so if you, if you don't have the model, you don't have the, the, the geometry in, your, in the computer, you, you can't really just take that structure and mimic it. I mean, you can't make a building out of this. But yes. if you have a computer model and you can do some analysis, you can actually. So you could, for example, you can imagine morphing it on a surface. So if you have a design space you like to fill, you can ask the computer to simulate, to create a solution where these uh, geometries are actually map on a surface. And in buildings, also, it's important to uh, design under uh, different loading. So with the computer, you can uh, test under different loading. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think for engineering applications, safety is it's also an important. issue. With the computational uh, model, you can predict which area will be easy to fail. And uh, you can also give some safety factor to maybe enhance those kind of parts but uh, only if you have the computational model. And I also put uh, defects, and then uh, right. yeah. how the defect can, uh, what's the uh, implication of the defect? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. sometimes, I mean, uh, because it's safety is extremely important in buildings, so it's important to know uh, which column, I mean, ma which cable is going to break first, and mm. then uh, to, and then pre uh, provide more time for the people to go out, so it has to be resilient. So there's a couple yeah. of other <laughs> ideas we have. This uh, one is actually that if you, w one thing we're trying to do is to watch the spider actually build the web, which I think in two D webs people have done this, and you can basically just take a video and you can see it. Except I don't think people have done it very systematically, as we could do with the laser scanning. But with the laser mm -hmm. scanning, we can we can actually watch the spider build it, and it's a really interesting material 
or structural design problem as well because you know building a complicated structure like this without scaffolding is really difficult so anytime you look at a building being built or even 3d printed structures and materials we have support material and scaffolds but the spider doesn't have any of this so it somehow creates takes an empty space and it cre and creates a space filling geometry um, without any support material and without any waste it's it's just built it right in there it's an amazing problem so there's a lot of interesting mathematics i think we can look at and, and, and mechanics and maybe learn for construction so we can learn how to build buildings more efficiently maybe by watching the spider build the web so that's another really interesting thing and the, the final thing i think we want to try is to say if you know spiders can actually repair the web when you damage it or when it's damaged they can fix it and that's another interesting dimension if you think about engineering applications that we can view the spider as an autonomous vehicle element that actually can basically autonomously move in space and deposit materials. And so what if you had a um, high-rise building in London or um, Tokyo, Hong Kong or someplace, and, or maybe in Boston here, and, and, you have, um, and you have something like a, like a spider, like a robot, like an like a, um, autonomous vehicle, UAV, that would be able to fly around in space and actually fix any kind of damage that would occur immediately. So it's an entirely different model where you don't wait until you have a crack developing and you go in and, and put somebody to fix it, but you actually have an autonomous vehicle that sort of lives with the building and would repair it on the fly whenever it's needed. If we could design uh, like structures as well as well as the spider, that would be uh, extremely. Uh, I think that's that's why I like I like the the fact that we can see it and it's from nature.